Roman, I just started the recording and uh, welcome everyone. This is the conservation districts focus group meeting. And uh, Roman is going to handle the meeting presentation and I request everyone to mute their microphones and keep them turned off and keep the tur cameras turned off as well, except if you are. Uh, yeah, I think there is some here, problem there. Here, Beza, I just muted you just because we were getting a lot of feedback there for a minute. Uh, Chair, I'd like to, would you like to unmute and try one more and see if we're getting that? Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, a little. We hear you. Okay. It's just a little. I disconnected the headphones. Yes, it's a little. The volume would be pretty low without it. I mean, we heard you a lot clearer before, but uh, we can hear you. So we'll. Uh, We'll look for, we'll listen in, we'll listen carefully. Um, again, so it's 3.33. Uh, I'm just checking attendance here. I see uh, members of the Conservation District Task Force. Uh, let me just go through the list. I, I, I know Zion Escobar is here. Peter Friedman is here. And uh, Meg Lustro is here. Lusto is here. Sorry about that. Um, and let's see, other members are here. Matthew Camp, is, I believe, is here. What about Steve Curry? Steve Curry is here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curry. And how about Rob Hellier? No, oh, Rob. And Kathy uh, Gunther. Ms. Kathy Gunther. And Mr. Curtis Davis. Okay. I'm here. Oh, he's here. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And uh, and uh, Melissa, I apologize. I don't remember the first name. I just took a note. Melissa Fontenot. 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 Ms. Fontenot, are you here? All right, well, we're doing pretty good with six six of the members here. That's great. Uh, with that done, we're already sharing the uh, the screen here. So today is the March twenty fourth, twenty twenty one Conservation District Focus Group virtual meeting. I uh, have a better camera on my laptop, so as a point of housekeeping, you might see me moving between these screens. Yet I got a faster connection uh, over here. So. With that, the agenda today is to um, review the draft recommendation narrative for the conservation district that I received comments from many of you on, and I want to say thank you for reading that document. And um, I have actually want to present that document. So if you haven't read it, I'll read it to you just now. It's not that long. Then we're going to review a chart that staff has worked on this chart breaks down the the narrative recommendations into a little more just a, you know a, a more descript technical way of seeing that information and then we were we're, we're hoping today that the task of this i'm hoping but it's not required that that uh, that we have consensus that this is a good way to move forward and make this recommendation on up to the larger livable places committee so with that, let's go over, it's, there's three slides, a lot of text, and I apologize, but I think it's important that I just go ahead and read it. I know most people don't read slides, but we're here for, 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 this, meet, for this purpose alone. <clears throat> so what that uh, narrative is saying is that the purpose of conservation districts is to provide a more flexible way for property owners to protect their community's character and address other concerns stemming from redevelopment the size of a proposed district may be just a few lots up to an entire neighborhood or the limits of an area of cultural significance. The criteria for creating conservation districts may include the existence of built historic resources, sites of memory. 
sorry, I got a little block on my screen. Common streetscapes, street patterns, significant archaeological sites, or above all, sites or areas of cultural significance important to the community or as a source of public pride. Mr. Freeman, I know you have comments on that, and I want to don't let we'll we'll come back and address some comments here. And let's let me just go through it once. So then the middle section is a little bit longer. The background uh, here, a little echo. But is that bothering anyone else? Or, I don't hear an echo. Roman. Okay. Thank you. The CDTF recognizes that the Conservation District Task Force recognizes that property owners in areas of local cultural significance, sometimes areas that have, did I read, already read that? Yeah, that, that have been historically disenfranchised or neglected, desire to protect their communities from incompatible development. While historic districts are a valuable tool, the requirements and criteria for creating historic districts, particularly the concentration of historic resources required and the level of property owner consent is often arduous. Conservation districts may offer more versatile protections for a wider variety of elements in a neighborhood in a more flexible process. Further protections should take the form of incentives as well as form based regulations. Equally significant, the task force recognizes the need to find ways to address the shortage of shortage of affordable housing. The areas under pressure are in the historic core of Houston, and they represent areas of key workforce housing and heretofore affordable housing. The CDTF sees potential conservation districts being used as part of a future policy as being used as a part of future policy tools in the implementation of strategies to address affordability, which should rely on incentives more than regulation. The final uh, part of the narrative, and this is the longest, is key points that the, this, the, the CDTF recommends are the following with respect to creation of an ordinance allowing for conservation districts in Houston. Conservation districts creation should be community led. Applicants should be initiated. Applications should be initiated by entities that have a vested interest in the area, such as property owners, homeowners associations, civics clubs, city council, residents, or and TERS boards. Property owner support should weigh heavily in the creation. Each conservation district would have, I actually think we have one word right, I would think this could say may have, um, but would have its own set of standards and standards. Sorry, no, that one is a direct, would, would have a set of standards and standards, accurate. Selected from pre-identified, selected from a pre-identified list authorized by city council upon creation of the conservation district framework. The standards and incentives may include, so no, the wording is exactly right. My apologies. I wanted to make sure that was a may. The standards and incentives may include massing, minimum lot size, lot width, lot depth, front, side, and rear setbacks, building height, demolition of significant buildings, driveways, or architectural style. Upon creation of an individual district, property owners would establish a process for approving projects. Actually, that process would be part of the establishment in the ordinance. A little minor word change there. The CDTF recommends that the level of property owner support required be commensurate with the type of restrictions or standards required on the properties. The type of review for these proposed districts may range from administrative review handled by staff and the planning director to review by the HAHC or some combination of the two, depending on the type of regulation. The CDTF recommends flexibility in the size of districts such that a district may be as few as two properties and have no maximum size. But that is the is the narrative. I had uh, pre received emails that this was a good document. Um, by the way, this is a, if anyone wants to interrupt at this point, now that I've read that through, I think we're fine. I wanted to, Mr. Friedman had a couple of comments and I'm hope I can get to him in a comfortable fashion here. Let me see if I can pull them up. Actually, I think Amanda may see him better. If you're here, staff member Amanda, and I see a hand. Um, 
I know one of your comments, Mr. Friedman, was about the boundary, and I was a little confused. It had to do with this section here, where we say uh, you were talking about um, there should be a, a. It sounded to me like you were you were saying it should be a specific area, and the area should be defined. And I and I was thinking that these areas could be defined. So I wasn't sure, Mr. Friedman, if you're there to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, really. Let me uh, let me see if I can clarify a little bit. First, I I I think the the language is really good in the in the document overall. I, I did I did like how it turned out. Uh, I I think one of my fears originally coming in on the conservation district would be that it was kind of a workaround to zoning, and my my fear is that it could still be used that way if people put in different types of requirements like building height or or other pieces that we would we would allow to be at new requirements um, or new restrictions that would then stop other types of building. So if I wanted a single family house only in an area, I would say that maybe the minimum the maximum height of a, of a of a building could be 30 feet. That could that would stop maybe some garden style or, or other types of multifamily from coming in. So I, I just want to I want to make sure that we also we're pointing out all the all how this could be created and the positive pieces that it, that mm -hmm. the creation of the work. Uh, but I, there's also th some things where I think it could be it could be used or abused in a way. And I want to make sure that maybe we point out that it's it, it's possibly a concern that it could go that way, or maybe some type of uh, uh, wording should be put into place where it, it would help prevent that in some sort of fashion. I, I understand that concern and I, I agree with that I, I, where you're coming from there. Uh, don't know if in my screen someone else started it. OK, this must be Amanda. You just checking those comments. OK, thank you, uh, staff member Amanda. And I see that hand up and we'll get to it. Just whoever you are, just keep it up a second, a minute or two here. There's that section. OK. Um, so good question and to this task force and to well i'm just wondering could that how do you how do you work that in um you don't want to uh you, you don't want to uh do deal with so how do you get so you have so you have some district come forth in an area with mostly you know one or two story single family family houses and they put forth a height I got a little bit of a work around that, but it's not quite there. And you'll see that. Let me go ahead and go to a slide that helps to answer that a little. And you have another comment I know. This slide, oh well, no. Amanda, can you mind if I share back, please, for a minute? We'll come back to yours. If you're, is that okay? Sure thing, no problem. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to here and see if this will pick up. Okay, this is a little small. I want to share this from, from the Word document, so bear with me a second. I understand it's a little hard to see there. Let me read share. I'm going to share this from a different source. I'm going to share it from this Word document. It should be a little bit bigger. Just a little bigger, uh, but the key is right here. This is a chart. Let, let me actually I didn't explain what this chart is. So this is a chart that tries to explain the details. So there's two that we were, pro were proposing here, which was mentioned in the narrative uh, or in an earlier draft of the narrative. So we, but is it there now? Let's think about it. Two belt, two levels of buy in. If you have low to medium regulation, let's call it, then uh, there or regulation that's non binding. That's medium level. That would be one level of buy-in. Maybe that's 50% of the property owners, as an example. And then if you have a binding regulation that includes demolition, and you'll note below that I say includes height, that that is a higher level, a higher bar, and that might be 67 or 70% of the uh, of the property owner. So it doesn't fix the problem, Mr. Friedman. 
but I think now, and so I pointed that out. And then the second part of this is about review, just letting you know that low to medium type items could be reviewed um, by staff with the director and uh, and then to create the district you do HHC. But coming down here in this chart, I tried to break down what might be considered high rate, something that needs a higher level of buy-in in order to be adopted. So if you're going to say that some historic resources in your community, whether that's five houses or 25 houses or 20 blocks or something, if it has that there will be demolition restrictions, that's a high level of buy-in. And I apply the same for building height. I told the staff here this morning, I did that intuitively knowing Houston, Texas. And I felt that, and, and maybe that's why, maybe we were kind of, I was thinking about it without thinking about it, but that that, that could be a higher level of buy-in. Now, that may be helpful to, to that. So as that district is larger, Mr. Friedman, and you, you imagine, you know, several more blocks, you got to get buy-in from a much higher percentage of people. Kind of helps a little. I don't know. Doesn't directly get to it. Well, Roman, this is, can I, can I interrupt for a moment and ask a question? This is Director Wallace Brown. Yes. So, and actually, I'm going to direct my question to Mr. Friedman because I'm I'm trying to understand what his question was. It, I mean, I I can foresee a circumstance where a neighborhood, and maybe it's just a few blocks, but but maybe it's larger, would say that as part of a conservation district, we are we are a neighborhood of small one-story homes and that by creating this conservation district we would like to prevent three or four story homes being put in this neighborhood I, is I, I i i see that as a possibility with the way this fo focus group is going is that not what you is that not how you envision this I mean, I could see that being a concern as well, but that's not what I was talking about. What okay. I was talking about was more if if you were coming in and saying this is only single family houses in this neighborhood and we want to keep it that way. We don't want duplexes. We want we don't want triplexes. We don't want multifamily. We don't want anything other than what we have right now. That could be an issue when it comes to density. If we're trying to improve density in, in Houston, it could also be an issue when it comes to affordability. Um, you could you could make a minimum lot size that would only allow larger homes on it. So it, it would be the opposite. It, so there's there's different there's different situations and even something like a driveway. A driveway doesn't seem like a, something that could be used to prevent um, development. But the, the way the, the tension rules work in Houston, you can't if you use a shared driveway, you are you are then responsible to have detention on on property. So if you were if you were trying to keep duplexes out of the neighborhood that had two separate driveways, you could say one driveway per property. And then if if somebody wanted to do a duplex, they had they would have to do a shared property. And you're then causing other issues for that developer. Okay. I'm sorry, did, did I did I answer that or I know I kind of went off. You did. I, I'm just trying. Yeah, you you actually you did answer my question and I'm trying to get a sense of what you and the rest of the folks on the focus group would, you know, where, what direction you want us to go with this? And, and that, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So now I'll ask Amanda, unless you remember, Peter, your other comment, Amanda could pull up a comment. I'm sorry, or we, we can check our sheet to see if we can remember. Do you remember another section? I think it was back. Roman, I think we, there's a couple of hands up. There might be some other feedback of other committee members. You got it. Absolutely. So, Folks, yeah, feel free to. Uh, uh, yes, this is Curtis Davis, Roman. My name wasn't under my, uh, you see C with a circle. I don't, for some reason, my name doesn't show up. A couple of points, and I and I put one of them um, in the uh, comments when I wrote, wrote my comments. Um, under the purpose statement, uh, um, there was a, a specific reference uh, to homeowners at the very beginning, and I suggested that we add and residents. Many of the neighborhoods, um, or some of the neighborhoods, are predominantly rental properties, 
or they may include a mix of homeowners and renters. And over time, particularly these properties, uh, these neighborhoods that are um, having a lot of townhomes being built in them, over time, the likelihood of those townhomes becoming rentals is relatively high. In many cities, that's the pattern. Our young um, urbanites come in, buy a townhome, get married, have a family, move out, and they rent their property. And there are companies coming into the market that are specifically targeting to do that um, as a service to those homeowners. So I anticipate that that will continue. So the question is, how do we explicitly reference non-property owners who are residents um, as part of this uh, interest group or a set of stakeholders? There are some neighborhood um, uh, groups in certain neighborhoods that do include renters in their civic associations and some that do not. The city standards specifically reference homeowners. So again, renters are typically not referenced in these types of documents. Um, if there's some legal issue or encumbrance to that, then putting the statement residence might also help uh, deal with that. So that's my first concern. And the second concern has to do with um, design issues where we reference um, building uh, architectural style. Um, I also put an urban landscape character as a general catch-all to this question of character and, and, and what constitutes that. It could include things like fencing that we've discussed. It could include things like landscaping, um, accessory um, structures and the like. Mr. Davis, uh, you get, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you and I had to check. Right here on, you were talking about under purpose, but we may not have covered it under purpose, but under here about their creation, mm -hmm. and here that they can be created by residents. Now that- no, I, I, I understand that. And, okay. And I did see that, but it should be under the purpose. Under well. the purpose, okay, okay, got it. In my, my, my recommendation, and, and again, I understand that a lot of these types of regulatory frameworks in the city are, are biased towards property owners for a variety of reasons. And 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 in terms of um, if there were any legal barriers to doing it, then I, I I wouldn't say let's assault the legal framework. But if there are not legal barriers to doing it, then I would want to make that work. So I want to I want to be sure. I think if the um, committee agrees, I, I don't mind. I mean, the task force uh, that change then that needs to happen right in here. Could you give me that where that might fit here is uh, well, well, right now it reads purpose to provide a more flexible way for property owners and residents to protect their community's character. I would add and residents. Okay, that's got it, got it, got it, got it. And then um, can you please go over the second point you made? Um, further, I think it was in your next uh, slide, you had a, a reference about architectural style. Yes, I, we, that term got discussed here internally as well this morning. Thank you, yeah, right here. Um, yeah. That's probably inadvertent. I, it probably should be about building. Well, that's okay, but, but what I was saying, I was adding to that urban landscape character whether you change that phrase architectural style or architectural character, it could be architectural and urban landscape character. You know, it could be a lot of ways to word that. But my main point was to include context with the architecture. Great. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And we have, and I, I see a comp, uh, let me come to the hand, hand up. Uh, I need whoever that got that hand. Zion, please go ahead. Uh, Ms. Escobar, please go ahead. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I agree with both of uh, Carl's comments, Mr. Davis's comments. Um, I do think we need to keep the architectural in there, just specifically for Fourth Ward. That is kind of our primary uh, focus as far as the heritage and the history of the district. Um, that's an important element of what's being preserved there. Overall, I really appreciate everything I've seen here and I've had a chance to share this with 
other communities of color and ask them what their thoughts are on this. And they, they, um, they are excited to hear that it's even being considered. And um, I didn't have any negative feedback on some of the key terms um, used here and the intention and, and things like that. So I just want to share that with everyone from a from so, couple of people in the community. I won't say the whole community because I could not share this widely as it's not publicly available yet. But with discretion, I shared it and got a lot of great feedback from other communities of color who are in the same situation that Fourth Ward, Freedmanstown specifically is in. Thank you very much, Ms. Esper. Thank you for the support of that. OK, and. Um, let's see. Uh, from here, I want to ask um, if there are any other comments. I don't want to go back to the comment sheet, but I just wanted to ask um, if there's any other. I know I felt like there was another comment or two from Mr. Friedman. Uh, and I want to well one I want to I, you know that's a, um, the director chimed in and we we've we, we've we're hearing you on that issue and I'm um, I think there's an opportunity that to you mentioned you know where does that fit I think before it gets out of livable places perhaps we can find some wording I, at the in the spur of the moment I can't figure out how you would um, articulate that to try to preserve the ability to make uh, to help with the density to be able to have garden style uh, places. Uh, I think I'm hearing that you know you don't want the residents to, to do that. At the same time, let me offer a, a little point about that. Historic districts, which this isn't, but historic districts, one of the reasons people created them was to protect that the single family houses and you know we go back into the not just in houston houston we began later in the 90s but earlier in the 80s in denton texas where i was from in the 80s there was a demolition of a big historic home and it was replaced by like 10 units of apartments and boy if they didn't pass a historic district ordinance in that neighborhood after that we don't want that here we lost a historic building one two we have this apartment that probably concern people, more traffic or more parking issues. So um, we, I, want, I mean, I'm, I hear you on that and I want to and I'll be attending if, if we're able to pass this out today, I'll be attending and looking for the opportunity to to find that solution. Mr. Davis. Um, yes, one suggestion on that language. Um, you, you, it could include that um, suggested regulation may not exclude um, proposals based on high housing typology. So that, that is to say, if someone were proposing to build a duplex in the form of a single family house, that what one should be trying to protect is the character and, and, and not say that a duplex by definition um, is out of character or is a feature that can be protected can be excluded in order to protect care. I like it gets us part of the way. So I and I, I hate to force you to do it, but suggested regulation may not exclude. Can you give that to me one more time? So shall, shall not shall not shall, shall not exclude a proposal based on housing typology. Now, how does that? I can hear I, I, I'm thinking. But if you exclude three story. Units or above three story buildings or above. Does that in fact. Well, it a three by excluding three story buildings. Um, it doesn't exclude a multi unit typology. Now there is a, a try, you know, you can look at typologies like tri, uh, triple deckers, for example, that you find in the northeast. And that would um, be problematic, but I, I think if, if that's not the right word, um, some phrase that speaks to the fact that the purpose of this in terms of character isn't about single family. If it's a residential character, there are ways of maintaining form and density that maintain the character that you're trying to protect. 
Mr. I think it doesn't go as far as excluding things like rental or affordable housing or uh, um, cooperatives or something like that, or yeah. co-housing, what, whatever people are proposing. I, I got and I've got that down. That may be a, a good solution. I hear uh, Director Brown, Director Wallace Brown. Sorry. Yeah, so I think that what he's looking for, we have similar language um, that can be taken out of the Historic Preservation Code, which says that, you know, within the Historic Preservation Guidelines, it's not meant to imply a single architectural style. There's um, there's also language in there that speaks to not excluding uses or not not um, regulating based on use. I, I think there's language that that we've already you know worked through with the community and with the legal department that we've got in the Historic Preservation Code that could be translated into this pretty easily. I, I, I understand exactly what he's saying. Mr. Friedman, does that uh, soothe your concerns at all about this? This I think it was Mr. Davis. No, but uh, Mr. Friedman had the original concern about uh, the exclusion of the part of uh, yeah. multi-unit. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do feel like that we're on the right path. I don't. I don't think we need to have a solution today. It's just I wanted to bring it up, kind of aware. Um, just like there's bad actors on the developer side, we just don't want this to be abused. We're doing this for it stays that. That's, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Director. Um, so, so yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, we have in the comments, uh, Mr. Camp has uh, placed a comment, but um, Mr. Matthew Camp, you are able to speak because you're one of the members. So please go ahead and make your comment. If you're able to, if not, we'll work off of the comment. OK, so the comment reads, if you set a restriction on density or housing type, lower the bar for the next level incremental increase. And I don't know what is meant by incremental increase, so I kind of want more explanation on this one. OK. Mr. Kim, we almost could hear you. It sounded like you were uh, trying to speak. Uh, and I get the first part. If you set a restriction on density, which you would mean if the if the if the applicant for a conservation district is uh, doing something that restricts density, uh, then then I just missed that part. I think you're talking about the adoption part of it. Then lower the bar for the next level uh, of increase. But we can't quite hear you, and I can't quite follow that thinking. Are you? Can you speak now? Can y'all hear me? Oh, we can. Be, I can hear you just a little. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Davis covered it and made a pretty good comment that you know you're, you're not limiting the use. So if you had, or if you were trying to limit the use to duplex, you should either lower the bar or allow the next incremental, like a triplex. Uh, be by a right, which would keep that same character or allow it to, you know, the, uh, a little bit of difference, but you're not going to a, you know, a fourplex or a sixplex that's in a duplex or single family. But I, I think it, you know, doesn't have to be resolved today, but it's how do you, how do you get that next level or how do you not freeze it in time forever and how do you allow something to kind of work with the character of the neighborhood and still just a little bit of next level incremental growth with that. I see. I see. I see. I see. I got that. Uh, and if uh, and we've got to record it. So we'll chew on that and uh, and make sure we get that uh, now. You said it didn't need to be addressed today, okay? Because it may need to be brought in at the level, you know, in the next step as it goes out, or uh, we'll just have to get it into the ordinance. But it's noted that that's a concern. Um, let me go now. Uh, let's go back and take a look at the word document. Is there anyone else that'd like to comment? Um, 
Oh, I want to comment from the, uh, this is a comment of a non, uh, just a guest in the meeting of Mr. Uh, Williamson. Uh, he said that he suggests the language using, com you say community led uh, rather than lead. I said, I, I got a tight, I got a spelling, spelling wrong is I think it's what you're correcting me on there. Maybe, uh, I think that's what you're, if you're, if you're there, I'm not sure if I'm catching. I see that he says suggest community led rather than lead, I think is what we got. So let me um, go back and share this version, which is easier to see. Just kind of coming back to that, I want to, so it sounds like we're working towards a, a consensus there on the narrative. And though, so I wanted to um, revisit this sheet and just kind of go over it this time a little more carefully. So we're talking about buy-in at two levels of buy-in. So this gets to the question of, you know, if you're going to regulate with, like the historic districts in Houston, you need 67 percent. Um, and um, in fact, we know there's a bill pending in the Texas legislature right now um, that really almost will require a supermajority for adoption of a of a district of this type. Um, so, so that that may become just a legal requirement anyway that. Uh, that you have this. So, but but generally what we were looking at, and this was kind of to resolve the problem of demolition is that we would have a low to medium, all the, if the regulation is none, for example, I could foresee that someone proposes a conservation district for an area or for an area around a cemetery or for a little few blocks where they say, you know, we just want to be recognized as a district. We want some attention upon us and we want the resources of the this office well, this office is a great office you know the three people here who are have studied architecture and i'm only an associate architect and i know we've got um people on here who are just but we have we have sources we know old buildings let's put it that way uh and so someone may say we just want staff's uh non-binding advice with respect to the, this area so very that could be what that district adopts or they could have some other level of of regulation off of this chart, for example, regulating, um, you know, the setbacks or the or the lot coverage here. Uh, and so as that moves up, that's that what we're suggesting. We're not putting a number on it right now, but we're suggesting that the um, that that might. I mean, off the top of my head, it might be, uh, which is a common heretofore a common level of. Um, need 51 percent or whatever it's just over 50 percent and then 67 is what we have a little higher in houston but it could become 70. so then the level of review for district creation and project approvals approval authority for district creation pretty commonly it's something that's seen by the hhc and then adopted by city council so being that conservation districts are a preservation tool i would think we would go to the historic commission and present the district so that they may or may not make a recommendation to city council. Then review of the projects, uh, again, low to medium uh, work would be reviewed at the staff level with the director. And then if it's in right now, I'm labeling demolitions and building height as kind of trigger trigger items. A good point here is on minimum lot size. The city already has you know, a minimum lot size uh, program. And what we wouldn't want to do is have a workaround for the adoption of that. I believe that the minimum you can have for adoption of minimum lot size is 51%. So that that would be in line with the medium for us. If there's if we would we would cross check this uh, and the other would be the uh, setback minimum building line is the other one that the city um, has already. Uh, and by the way, it's important to note that if a district or some applicants came forth and said we just want a lot line or a building line or a lot size and that's all well of course we're going to say well go on let's let's work down the hall with our planning department and let's do that in the way that's already set up that's a different thing from a conservation district where someone's saying we want this area recognized for this reason or we want to have these a little bit broader protection and adopt them all at once under a conservation district and again, here are those, um, those things which you've seen. And then just a note down at the bottom that we're, we're looking like this would adopt, we're, we would extract just out of the historic district ordinance, 
the adoption technique tech. We know that this is meant to be easier to adopt than a historic district. That and what it really more more flexible tool than a historic district. So one, you're able to designate an area not based on architectural resources like a historic district, but you can do it on all these for those reasons we stated in the purpose. However, uh, when it comes to how do you adopt it for transparency, the existing system under historic districts works pretty good. 10% of property owners are required for an application to be initiated, just initiation. After that, the application follows the notification process. Uh, sorry about that. That is that is for creation of districts. Let me get that in there right there. So uh, that is that it's publicized. So let me just give you an example. We have an application for a historic district right now over in the West End. Uh, when we receive that application, once it's considered a complete application, we schedule a public meeting and invite everyone that uh, we know in the district. Every, we use HCAD, we get all the property owners, they all get a, a mailed notice. We also uh, mail send notice these days, email notice to you know the Washington Avenue super neighborhood, the Rice Military District, uh, uh, the associated neighborhoods around there. And so they all get that notice for that first public meeting where we explain how a district is created and that there is an application for one and where it is. And then at the completion of that meeting, we mail a notice to all the uh, property owners in the district and we ask for them to vote. It's a petition. They're either for the district or not for the district. We get those back. We look for the 67 percent. And at that point, you can, if you don't have the 67, you can adjust the map or staff would, can adjust the map. If you have the 67, then you go to the uh, public hearing of the HAHC and the public hearing. So then you put uh, your signs out in the district, a minimum of three or a minimum of four signs. I think it's three signs minimum in the proposed district announcing the public hearing. Uh, and again, mailing that notice to the property owners per HCAD. So then that you have that meeting, HAC considers the district. If they recommend approval, then it's on to city council, where again, it's a public, uh, I believe a public hearing at city council here. Uh, and so there is that, so there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in and in a, in a, the, the emphasis is on a very transparent uh, uh, program and system and so that's why I have a note there that we would if y'all are okay with it we would follow that um, that as a recommendation for just on the uh, on how the communication happens any questions um, on this? Roman this is this is Curtis Davis with a comment yes um, uh, to complement this uh, chart that you're showing and to um, kind of clarify what you just described, I'd, I'd recommend that staff put together a couple of process flow diagrams that compare the historic district process versus the conservation district process. And for me, what I understood the primary distinction to be, without getting into the detail of the process, is that the what we're proposing in the conservation district is primarily prescriptive in terms of just establishing uh, what's recommended. Um, whereas in the historic districts, they tend to be, my experience has been that they tend to be proscriptive in terms of determining what's not allowed. So that process flow diagram should really make that distinction between what's prescriptive and what's proscriptive in the two uh, different processes and, and a flow diagram would be very helpful because people can comment on it. Usually one way to make things less regulatory, more flexible is to have a very clear design review process that's very efficient and tightly managed so that the proponent doesn't run through a gauntlet. But to be able to present their proposal in the context of their understanding of the country conservation district guidelines have that reviewed initially by staff and by you know a small group of locals who are involved get comments 
have the footprint make whatever revisions based on those comments, and then that is what's reviewed for final action. So I, I think the process of this is going to be very important as to whether it's viewed as being onerous or not. Okay. Now it's yeah. So there'd be a, a, a diagram showing um, it. It, it, it kind of would be a version of really. You just need to diagram out the at least these upper two questions of of how is it adopted and then how are projects approved. Is that what you're right. on a comparative basis? You know, on we've got a, yeah. So if you have two processes and you show them parallel, or you just show them on two different pages. So that's a typical process flow diagram. Um, mm -hmm. that, that I think that will help everyone um, fully understand what's being proposed, and um, and and that will give an opportunity to to figure out where the friction might be in the process and how we might make adjustments so that it's as little friction in it as possible. That sounds good. I it it, it it but the you know I'm thinking the diagram at this stage in the process could be could be hard to make if if we're allowing the neighborhood or the applicants to um, to determine their level of review. Again, going back to the idea that it might be a non-binding staff recommendation or that do they want to have an actual approval, a binding, a binding regulation. So I guess the, the, the process diagram can show, you know, here are your options. You know, whatever, you know, maybe there are three options. It's going to be high review, low review, no review, you know, or staff review or whatever. And then if 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 it's high review, then here's here's the path that it follows. If it's medium review, here's the path that it follows. If, if it's just staff review, here's the path that it follows. Sounds great. I would I, yeah. I would lay that out ahead so that the groups can have an ABC pick one rather than a spend time scratching your head trying to invent it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, Chair Basil, you're you're welcome. Um, to speak. Here, go ahead. Miss Escobar, I think has you hear me. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the name. I'm sorry. And then Miss Basil. Your volume is too low, Miss. I can hear. I'll translate. You go, Miss Escobar, if you don't mind holding. I can hear the chair here. Is that okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm having problems with all this. Uh, I want to applaud the previous speaker's comments about offering some op options. Uh, the one thing about the historic district designation, it is a high bar, and the threshold for approval is 67% of those voting, and that is a very high threshold uh, that is hard to uh, attain and to encourage more historic districts. So if there's um, some options on on the uh, process, I think that would be a very helpful thing to look at. Thank you. I don't know if everyone uh, could hear her, but she was saying that options on the adoption process are good in terms of those levels because the 67% is hard to achieve. Or, Uh, Ms. Escobar? Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to, um, the note on the bottom about the 10%, it still says owners. And um, I think for the conservation district, specifically in our community, I would, I would need that to say owners and residents or residents just to align with the other stuff. Um, and I absolutely agree on the process diagram. Um, and having conversations with folks, it's easy to get tripped up on what is and what isn't and what this this tool, um, what consequences it has, and if it's going to slow down development. And I don't want that perception to be something that keeps people from supporting it. And so having it very clearly articulated, even and I, I also um, I like the idea of having it on two separate pages because not everyone who's looking for a conservation district is also interested in a historic district and those two things side by side can muddle the conversation for people. Um, but in our community, we definitely will use them together. We'll just use whatever two individual sheets that you, you provide as our talking points to help people understand the consequences 
or lack of consequences that comes with this um, and how it's not it's not a, a big process once they see that the actions are staff review, there's already staff review. So if you know emphasize that those two things can be combined at whatever level the review takes place, just so people don't think there's a third or fourth step they have to go through another review process because in speaking to folks um, already about this, they're like, oh no, that sounds like a great idea, but if I have to go through two more approvals, I don't want it, even though I think that's a great idea. <laughs> So right. anything that dispels that myth would be very, very helpful. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thank you. Do any other uh, any other comments? It was really nearing the end of the agenda that the uh, as we were saying earlier today, I'm looking for consensus. Uh, on this, let me share the. We go back to the PowerPoint real quick here. Um, just gonna go back to here. I hear some Minette need to be readmitted. Share. So um, back to to this document. Yeah. So really, just. Looking for consensus, so I, I just ask, uh, do do we feel we need to have another meeting? Or, uh, and I've reviewed this with staff internally. We're we're comfortable with this level of of um, of detail uh, as a recommendation up to the next committee. If you are, and. Uh, I, so I don't I you don't want to you know can I somehow get a consensus and I'm not the chair here so it's always a little awkward I'm just a, a, a staff member here working for you at the city of Houston so um, I would at this point if, if y'all are feeling comfortable and I think we had again there were a couple comments I don't think the people have spoken but that the uh, that the document is a good document and it's a good way to go forward we don't have all the members here today. We have about six people uh, from the committee, from the task force. Um, are y'all ready to move forward with this and recommend make this? We'll package this narrative up with this document and anything we discussed it. If there was something I missed adjusting now, we'll adjust it. But can this would y'all recommend we go ahead and take this to livable places? Roman, can I can I make one more comment? This is Peter Friedman. Sure, sure. Uh, the, the the other piece of that I had the question about was just on on protections for affordable housing, um, because some of some design architectural styles can be more expensive. Um, my other comment I had made on there was about about that this could be either there could be some kind of protection or or um, opportunity. For um, affordable housing in this in these situations to be treated slightly differently, uh, Mr. Davis had mentioned something in the past about maybe funds being available to be able to keep up with um, the cost associated with some of these things. But until that's actually put into place or there is that opportunity, I could see this as being um, a more expensive proposition on some type of housing, and it could end up unfortunately pushing out affordable housing. Thank you. That that's a very good. I remember now that's. Uh, <clears throat> I know Mr. Davis there. Can you can you? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Roman, just to, to echo um, Mr. Freeman's point, um, I, I, I on the architectural style, one way to get at that is uh, just recognize if you change that to architectural character and and character is more generalized in style and it gives more flexibility. And then as we get to some more effective meat to support affordable housing development that meets more stylistic concerns, um, that's great. But if we leave it at character, style is a subset of character. Okay, I'll, I'll have to make that an adjustment in the Word document, but um, that gets that. That's part of it, but yeah, I understand that protections 
And th 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 there's a part of this that we have to take a, and Mr. Liu, I see Mr. Liu has a comment. Let me just say there's a part of this that is a, a trust factor because we mentioned in the narrative that we foresee this being a tool that it could be used as a policy tool in addressing issues of affordability. And I think Mr. Freeman, you alluded to that, that, we're, that we don't have that now. So we do need to be careful with that wording. Um, Mr. Kirby Liu? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I was just wondering uh, if, what is the process for um, determining or arbitrating, like what is in keeping with the architectural character? Um, is it going within the current historic uh, preservation department within the city? Are they the ones who sort of make the final kind of say so on if this is meeting with the community style guidelines or architectural um, character guidelines? Oh, sure. Uh, and you're, are you referring to when you're doing like a project review or are you thinking of more like when you create the district, if you create a future district? Well, I'm saying when you first, when you um, maybe create the district, uh, how concrete are the architecture character guidelines? Um, and then secondly, is that with the review process uh, of does this proposed design meet the architectural character of the uh, district, the, of the conservation district, um, who kind of makes that uh, judgment call? Okay, let me see if I can address that. And I'm going to jump back over to the Word document because it's a little bigger for y'all to see. And I think the answer kind of lies here. It depends is the answer. So we up here where we talk about um, the levels of review for project approvals. So, and this would be determined by the applicant. So you could have, again, I was talking about earlier about a case where someone could ask for a district where they just want a preservation consultation. They want non-binding advice on how to preserve a little a cluster of properties or something on up to someone may come forward with a, a, a larger district. Uh, and then if they choose low to medium ranking requirements, or let's say regulations that are like the, the, the lowest shown here is fences, which are you don't even need a permit for up to, as you all know, up to eight feet or whatever. Uh, and this now we're going to you know look at the word character here, which gets us closer. Um, but and then walkways, landscape, driveways, massing, setbacks, lot coverage, lot depth, lot width, uh, and minimum lot size are all in this low to medium area. So we would be recommending that those be, be reviewed by staff and the director. In other words, uh, those are internally reviewed. They don't go before the HHC. The only items we would suggest at this point going to HHC would be demolition and building height. So when the district is created, it's sort of, uh, it's in that application by those people. That's one of the things about conservation district, the idea behind it is that it's tailor-made to a district. Um, I, I was throwing out some examples this morning. Uh, you know, this is, and this doesn't help with the affordable housing question, but just as an example, if you look at, is it garden villas over off a of telephone road with the really large lots that are out there that if I got the right name there if y'all know Houston well you know there's places with like half acre lots probably or so down there so those people may want to preserve the character of that area um, they may be more worried about preserving the character of that landscape than they are about the, the particular buildings um, so it, it depends I don't think I've answered your question, but have I gotten somewhere along there? Mr. Liu, if you can. I, yeah, I guess I'll just have to wait and see. Can, can uh, you give it I'm to me sure. again? I mean, this now's the time we, we, we should. I thought your well, question was, was who, who review? Oh, I see. Who decides who review or who decides whether there's care? Well, if it's staff right. review for a project and I, and again, architectural style was written in there, and I'm glad that Mr. Davis suggested changing it to character because this morning I suggested that it ought to say something like 
building elements or something because the historic districts at least it's not this is not specifically about historic preservation this could be about an area where there's not a lot of architectural integrity which for example some neighborhoods where we thought about this might this might apply would be independence heights uh where there are a few homes left remaining that have uh, a lot of historic architectural integrity the homes are intact but you have quite a lot that have uh, undergone lots of renovation to the point that if you were making a historic district, those homes would be called non-contributing because the, the homes have lost their architectural integrity. Um, so it's, it's, it's when the district is created and further, I'll take that a step. We, we didn't talk about an inventory, but I think that could be a part of the adoption by a district where you where you just where the neighborhood, the applicants may say these are the contributing homes and we don't want them demolished. So then we go to that very high bar of needing high buy in. HAC review for the particular houses or structures that the neighborhood, the applicants are saying um, shouldn't go anywhere, shouldn't be demolished. They're significant to the neighborhood. So Robert, yes, sir. Um, one one suggestion, the way I think about the distinction between architectural style and architectural character, uh, style usually is a historic reference in my way of thinking, and you'd make reference to specific periods of time, Romanesque, um, Victorian, all that sort of thing. And it, you get into architectural details, Corinthian columns versus Ionic or Doric columns and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of character, you might begin to talk about more form based and function based aspects. Um, center entry, um, deep porch, stoops. Um, uh, you might get into roof pitches or you may just say hip roof versus not. Um, that kind of thing. You talk more form and function when you talk about architectural character and style more generally has historic references or specific contextual references to buildings in the immediate area. The other is more generalized and allows you a little bit more flexibility. So that's the way I think about the distinction between the two. Thank you very much for that. Is there off the top of your head here, then when we're on this point, this this does this. This is probably. Uh, uh, you know, could, is this character, is, but change that to character get us there? Yeah, probably does. Um, but uh, Mr. Lou, uh still worried about your concern i want to make sure you feel comfortable with that or hope that i can address it. it it's not so much i have a specific concern it's just more of a point of clarification um what the because i guess i guess the one concern i do have is things may be a little bit vague especially when you get into this sort of architectural character and what ha and what have you it's hard for someone to um, anticipate what that might mean. So someone might, you know, say, okay, well, you know, we have a porch, but our building is bright pink, bright purple. So are we in the architectural character? You know what I mean? I'm just sort of thinking about how, I mean, I'm not suggesting everyone's going to make it bright pink, but I'm just saying that uh, it's a little bit hard to interpret what that means. Um, yeah, I think I get a clear that. Way. I, yeah. I think what you're talking about, I've experienced, and is that it, it's just the subjectivity that you that is there. It's the, the eleven criteria for approval in a historic district are are subjective criteria. Some of and sometimes they're more concrete, but a lot of times they, it can be seen as subjective. And maybe that's what's so great about the conservation district in the fact that it's not going to be based on, I mean, generally, it's, probably, it's not going to be based on architecture. I mean, the, the point you want to save the, the specific buildings, you've got to let, you can landmark it or you can make a, a historic district where you're really focused in on that. But the point of the conservation district isn't that at all. It is about form and function uh, as, as, as uh, Mr. Davis pointed out. I mean, that's, I think that's what people want it, that I know of in the district. First of all, let me say that I don't can't even believe understand where someone might want to put these districts. But I do know presently where we have some idea. That's Freedomstown and uh, also uh, Independence Heights, where they're it's being it's something that they're anticipating that this ordinance shall pass and that maybe it would be adopted. 
and in those neighborhoods they, they've lost a lot of architectural integrity except for a few buildings so there is that subjectivity mr lou and i think unfortunately that is common your comment there relates often when you have i hate to say it when you have non-professional architectural uh people running your preservation department, you can have that. And when you bring up color, for example, when I moved to Denton, Texas, I, when I interviewed for the job, I had a funny moment where they said, I looked around at Denton, Texas, which is a high, one of the wealthiest counties in our state. And I said, why do you even need a preservation officer? This place looks like a museum. All the houses are perfectly restored. Everything's just, you walk through downtown square, you can eat off the sidewalk. Uh, and they said, well, we have a problem because the commission members get into arguments over color and the neighborhoods get upset and I right away said wait a minute wait a minute you mean you're discussing color in a historic I said yes you're, you're I can help you because color has nothing absolutely nothing to do with historic preservation um, it matters if there's paint on the building or not paint on the building if it's wood other than that um, the color it shouldn't be regulated so a lot of times I think I think you know I believe Houston's made an investment in in this department and you know we've had an ordinance since the 1990s and it's evolved and it's evolved with input from the community so i I'm, I'm hopeful that we will have an ordinance that people could be proud of and will want to adopt this and when, with our staff here i, I you know it's it, your interaction with the office of preservation should be a pleasurable one and you should feel like you walked away like, okay yeah i learned a little something and, and i got a little better project for it uh, and it didn't take very long um, and that's that's what I try to push us towards. To Got help. it. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Well, I'll go back to my question. How do we feel about consensus of moving this forward? Bring it back up here. Uh, I'm looking for kind of a recommendation that we move this, we we move this, uh, that we make this uh, narrative uh, and this chart of information uh, a recommendation out of the Conservation District Tax Force up to the Livable Places uh, uh, larger committee. Do 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 the members uh, feel that this is appropriate? We have a couple of votes in the chat. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go over to the chat. I see yes, from, I see yes, I see yes, I see, and I see confirmation the Garden Villas is half acre lots. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I see if, uh, um, uh, some support there, four people, Mr. Lou, Ms. Escobar, Mr. Davis. And I'm going to Steve Curry and respond verbally. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's about I think that's almost everyone in this group. Um, let me reverse that. Any nays? Anyone just said I'm not I can't get behind this. Anyone? It's OK. It needs a, I see a hand. Maybe that person. I saw a hand over here. Chair Basil. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I just wanted to know about the initiation of the district. There seems to be some question uh, about the creation of the district and the methodology. So I assume take all our comments and put that in. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We, we will do, do that. But, but, uh, yes. This is Savida. Can you repeat what Ms. Basil was saying? Because for yeah. record keeping sake, and yeah, yeah. We, we need that. Ms. Thank Basil, uh, Chair Basil, correct me if I'm wrong. You said you heard concern for how it's adopted, how a for future conservation district might be adopted, and you wanted to be sure that that language of how it, the adoption happens is clear. Is that right? Yes, yes. So there was a discussion of a comparison chart. Yes. Okay, yes. Do that's right. Uh, the comparison chart. And the question is, does that go? Do we need to put that in here now? Or that can that be something that's drafted? 
I think, and I think for clarity, if I'm not sure, Mr. Davis was saying, we just don't want future people. I think if I'm understanding, that could be something that if this moves forward to the commission, livable places committee, and then forward on for an ordinance, that we would produce those documents if that's, unless that's uh, not what I'm, what we're agreeing to. Roman, I think we will need those at least for the committee discussion because that will be a public process with um, the public participating and looking at it and we'll have an opportunity to Great. understand better, comment. Okay, well then we'll, then we'll get a break into that. And uh, well with that, I, look, I, you know, that's all I had on the agenda, everybody. Um, We've done the three items. We reviewed the narrative. We reviewed this matrix and we had an open discussion. And I want to say thank you to um, to all of you very, very much for your patience. Um, Roman, before you wrap up, I would like to ask you the question of, OK, what is the next steps and what are we concluding the work of focus group today or? Um, Yes. And what will happen next? Can you please clarify that for the team? Well, I don't know every part of it. I know this part. I think that this concludes, but let me say it doesn't disband. I, I think this concludes the work of this Conservation District Task Force, that from here we will carry this to the Livable Places committee, uh, committee. I don't, um, I would ask to kind of divert, to, uh, refer to you, uh, defer to you, Savita, that how that uh, gets on an agenda there, and uh, I can present this on behalf, uh, you know, on behalf of the task force. The reason I say we're not disbanded is, I, uh, dear task force members, if it, the Livable Places Action Committee were, for example, to say uh, they don't like some part of this or this part needs more analysis, uh, we, we, then I want to be prepared to quickly call another meeting and, and, and look at that issue. But outside of that, I feel that this is wraps up the, uh, the work. Perfect, Roman. I just want that to be clear for everyone is we will present this to the Livable Places Action Committee uh, on the next meeting in April. I think it's April 20th. Mm -hmm. And once we get feedback and input from the whole committee, then if needed, we will come back, but if it moves forward from there, I think we did a great job. We definitely did a lot of progress, and this is impressive that we drafted this framework with all of your support and input. We appreciate that. Thank you for your work and your team. I do see a, a hand up from a, a guest, uh, Sandy, Miss Sandy Stevens. Is that right? Thank yes. You the committee members so yes please go ahead Ms. Stevens. I apologize I had a conflicting appointment and I'm just joining the meeting but I know that when I had um, previewed the draft I noted that um, super neighborhoods were not included as one of the initiating um, organizations and I wondered if that was intentional or an oversight or yeah so if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. It, it wasn't intentional. Uh, if if that if the if you, the committee feels that we can add super neighborhoods to uh, to this list here, I'm happy to do so. Is that okay with the other members? Anyone opposed to adding? Super, is that how I would describe them as super neighborhoods here? Super neighborhood groups, or how does that work? I forgot. Super uh, neighborhoods. Those are official um, designations by the city of Houston that were done by Lee Brown back in the 80s uh, to give uh, neighborhoods an, an opportunity to have direct uh, interaction with city government. Two Thank different wor two words, though. Thank you. I, I apologize. I remember yeah. when. Chief Lee Brown or, or the mayor uh, yeah. uh, did that, but I it's been a while and I'd never belonged to one. I'm sorry I went off to grad school and, and was too busy there, but uh, I got it. Well, thanks for accommodating at a last minute. I, I had noted that and just couldn't get here earlier. I apologize. And we got residents here. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Be a capital. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Steves. Thank you very much. Any other comments? 
Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all again and for things moving forward. Thank you, Roman, for your work on this. Thank the team. Thank you very much. This is really fantastic. Uh, thank you. Roman, I'm stopping the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Savita.